Welcome back to the Welsh History Podcast, episode 49. The Elephant in the Room, Geoffrey Monmouth. Over the past few months, we have been talking largely about three writers who we depend on for most of the early post-Roman Britain history. That would be Gildas, Bede, and Nennius. Uh, there are key components in understanding life and politics in both sub-Roman Britain and their own respective centuries. Always when we look at writers of history, no matter the era, we must put them in context of their own bias and their own experience. And of course, these three writers are key to our understanding of anything to do with these eras because they're some of the few that wrote. Uh, last week, we got to the end of the commentaries about Penda and the Welsh kings that he fought with. And now, as we move past the death of Penda and the death of Cadwallon and the death of Edwin and the death of Oswald and the death of Oswiu and all of these characters who have come into the discussion, we're going to change our sources. We're going to be changing some of them anyway, because, of course, Nennius's writings end at this point. Bede, of, or Gildas, of course, has ended long before that. And we haven't really got much longer with Bede because we're getting closer and closer to his time period. We'll move on to new ones, of course. We'll go into the Welsh Annals, into the Chronicles of the Princes, into the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. We'll also pick up a Welsh writer who's writing about an Anglo-Saxon king. Uh, he's writing about Alfred and and his opinions of him, but also he's writing to, at least has been suspected, a Welsh audience. So he's interesting to look at. Asser is his name, and he's a monk from uh, St. David's in the later part of the 8th and 9th century. So he is a very different author to writing about a very different topic, but still a very important source for us to talk about in Welsh history, along with, obviously, Anglo-Saxon history. Um, but there's one author we have talked about a little. I haven't given him a lot of support other than to talk about him fairly negatively, to be perfectly blunt, uh, for various reasons, not the least of which is because a lot of scholars think of him very bluntly to be a very poor scholar and that his writings are something to take with a large dose of salt. And that is Geoffrey Monmouth. Geoffrey Monmouth, of course, uh, wrote his books at the beginning of the 12th century. He's writing in an era when he is living in Oxford. He is clearly writing towards a Norman audience. His comparisons and discussion points fit a lot of the Norman issues that are going on at the day, uh, some of which we'll discuss, of course, because they'll affect Wales, others of which we might not talk about simply because they don't have a lot to do with uh, the discussion that we're going forward about Welsh history as opposed to English history. Um, but in his commentary, there is a lot of skepticism. And even in his own day, there's a lot of skepticism. One of the famous quotes is by William of Malmesbury, uh, who's writing his own history of England. And he says, this Arthur, who comes from Geoffrey Monmouth's books, uh, in a way, and we'll get a little bit into that, about whom the foolish tales of the Britons rave even today, one who is clearly worthy to be told about in truthful histories rather than to be dreamed about in deceitful fables, since for a long time he sustained his ailing nation and sharpened the unbroken minds of his people to war. And also commenting on this is William of Newburgh. Now, William of Malmesbury, I think, is talking largely about Jeffrey Monmouth. And we'll get into why in a second, but let's let's go a little further into another quote, which I, I really like. But in our own day, instead of this practice, a writer has emerged who, in order to expiate the faults of these Britons, weaves the most ridiculous figment of imagination around them, extolling them with the most impudent vanity about the virtues of the Macedonians and the Romans. This man is called Geoffrey, and his other name is Arthur because he has taken up the fables about Arthur from the old British figments. He's added to them himself, has cloaked them with honorable names of history by presenting them with an ornament of Latin tongue. So as you can see, there's, there's a lot of skepticism, to say the least, about this. And several writers in the day are very critical of him. 
and of his writings. And it's interesting because at the same time as that's going on and Jeffrey's publishing his documents, he becomes a figure of popular imagination. His writings and his manuscripts are hugely popular. Why do we think they're popular? Because a 12th century manuscript that's been written and we have copies of 250 of them. That means he had staying power because we know that a lot of times uh, we just don't have multiple copies of some books. Sometimes we have maybe four. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, for example, there are, is relatively few considering what the story is about. Uh, there is a wide variety here and a lot of people who've taken Jeffrey's commentary and his writings and have looked at it as history. In fact, it's very common even today for people who have interest in the Arthur myth to use Jeffrey as a point of information and, and they look at him as being historical and they'll quote from him and his ideas. And, and this is a problem because what it does is it devalues what could be historical stories by taking on what amounts to fictional writing. I mean, if you look at the history of Britain as the kings of Britain, as he's written, it starts out with a mythological Celtic king who there is no evidence of uh, having debates with Caesar. And of course, that in and of itself is obviously uh, fictional. Uh, most of his ideas, his writings surrounding the characters are spurious, I would guess, and say at best there's no real evidence for some of the stuff he's talking about. Now he does what a lot of people in those eras used to do. He appeals to ancient texts that he's found that no one else has ever found. But a lot of his actual historical stuff only really comes from the sources we already have. His extra stuff, his extra information is great. But the reality of it is it's very difficult to sort of pin down and say, oh yeah, that's that's definitely truthful. That's definitely accurate. It's It's unfortunate, really, because what it does is it starts to make it harder for people to look at other sources and give them credit. I know Welsh poetry, for example, has been and is a use for me when I'm looking at sources when I can't find a lot. And they write about that era. I mean, Yigadothan is a hugely important and influential text. But if you have guys like Geoffrey Monmouth wandering around saying the stuff he's saying, and the only evidence we have of some of these poems comes from a specific period well after the fact, then it's very difficult to then for a historian or an archaeologist to then go back and say, no, 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 there's evidence that this goes much farther. But with Jeffrey, there's none of that. There's no belief that he is pulling from an ancient source text that nobody else has. He's doing a lot of uh, something that's very common, especially in classical writers, where classical writers, to make their point, we talked about this a bit with Tacitus, they have a tendency to put words in the mouths of of the characters of the book, right? So like uh, uh, Boudicca has a big speech, she says. Well, there's no real way that he could have heard that or that somebody would have written it down so that he could read it. There's just no evidence of any of that. So realistically, what we have is we have a made-up speech given by Tacitus put into the mouth of uh, Boudicca to get across a point, and the point is not about freedom for the Celts or an ability for them to defend themselves as Britons. This is about him making points against the local emperor and how discouraged and dissatisfied he is with them currently, and talking about the decadence of Rome. So he uses the old noble savage technique, right? So the, the Celts are these poor, uneducated people, but because they're poor and uneducated, they're more pure, they're more developed than them. So we have to be very careful in these circumstances. You can't just accept face value what things are written down. But there was a time where people did. And the reality of it is most historical, in quotes, authors are not there to try and teach history as we know it. They're not built up around the concept that history is a simple story to be told based on evidence and based on archaeology and based on written sources. It's history based on what do I want you to take from this? What is the point of this information? And of course, for Ger Jeffrey, he's writing in a period of time where it's very much a, 
a Norman world, very much a normal, or normal, very much a Norman uh, concern. He has built up within himself uh, a message that he's sending to the people of that era, and he's doing it by using the example of the Britons. And it's a very old concept and idea, right? Going back to the concept that we are talking about a people who were oppressed, who were taken over by a wicked king. You know, Vortigern comes to mind as being sort of an example of a wicked king who usurped authority. Uh, a lot of scholars feel that the, that Geoffrey Monmouth's writings are based around the, uh, the period of the, uh, the anarchy when Stephen and Matilda are fighting over the leadership of, of the Norman England. And so he's talking about Stephen here. That's, that's their thought, is that he's suggesting that Stephen's usurpation of Matilda's throne is an example of Vortigern, uh, that he uses these examples and discussions about this ancient king who never existed talking to Caesar, uh, that he uses, you know, various points. And the other thing is he doesn't get close to history in his own period. He only goes up to this ending bit in the seventh, mid-7th century. He doesn't go beyond that. So really, we have a character who's writing about history that's difficult, at least at that stage, to prove a lot. Although some of the scholars, even from his own time period, are denying his point of view. Even if they do believe in the Arthur myths and the Arthur legends, they're still not believing his version of the truth. And his excuse that he found ancient writings that nobody's seen before kind of annoys him, <laughs> or annoys them, I should say. And so his ideals have always been sort of bashed, even, you know, from long ago when he first published this book, all the way till now. But yet he is still incredibly popular because the story he's telling is compelling. That's the thing. A good writer can make up for bad history. And unfortunately, in some respects, and, you know, we know about this in modern times. There are a lot of times where people have written things, you know, if you look at, and, and I'm not making this comparison to make it an exact comparison, but to tell a story. Mein Kampf is a story of the history of Germany after World War I and why they're so, you know, why there's this need for a Nazi party because of how picked on and bad everything has been for them. And it's a political document. But yet there's a historical element to it. And Hitler's goal and agenda is very clear. Well, Jeffrey's kind of, and again, not making the comparison to Mein Kampf. I'm making a comparison to the idea that history can be manipulated because of the message you're trying to make. That's what Jeffrey's doing. He's manipulating his history to make a point. He's using fictionalized or fictional characters to make that point. And it's great because... The best thing you can do in those circumstances is use somebody who doesn't exist and is hard to prove doesn't exist because how do you prove he exists? You know, uh, Arthur's a great example of that. It's, it's not that Arthur couldn't have existed. It's that there's no fundamental evidence that he did exist. And so thus the argument has continued for nearly two millennia about his existence or not. Um, and that kind of thing continues to roll on and on and on for years and years and years, and it becomes so difficult to sort of unpick once it's begun. And we see these kind of things go on, and it makes it very difficult for historians because you're fighting against popular idea. If you want to point out that, hey, maybe we shouldn't be doing X or Y or Z, or maybe we shouldn't totally believe this source, because, well, look at some... I mean, think of people who have talked about the Bible as history versus people who have pointed out that there are things in the Bible that are inconsistent with history, and see the reaction from the faithful towards that opinion. The reality is, is that for some people, they try that much harder to try and prove the point that it is history. Other people will bash you as basically being against God because you've said this isn't history. Uh, and it becomes a very difficult conversation. It doesn't stop at sort of being a, a rational or an academic discussion. It now becomes a faith-based discussion, which can be very brutal and very hard and very difficult. And of course, up to the modern day, when this continues in other subjects, Arthur's a very controversial subject, so he is always going to be one of those key trigger points. And Jeffrey is part of the problem. He is the poster boy for what's wrong 
with our history in this period because he's not using source material past a certain point. He's developing it where it doesn't exist. If it doesn't fit or it doesn't exist or it doesn't fit his story, the story means more than the history. And ask any historian how much they love that when they go to a cinema and watch a movie or watch a TV show that says, based on historical events, and it's not. Or it is, but only in the very loosest sense of the term. It, it, it grates on a lot of us who have an interest in history to watch and see obvious problems in a very simple solution that could have been developed to make things more historical, but sometimes get compressed or get destroyed because the story is more important than the history. And really, I think when we look at Jeffrey, that's what we have to evaluate. His story is so important to him that history no longer matters to him. So he's not really sourcing things. He's not really looking for a lot of information. You know, he's at Oxford. He has obviously got access to historical documents, to writings of that era. He obviously has access to a lot of them because he's quoting from some of them, like Bede, like Gildas, like Ninius, you know, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle and all these kind of things. He's pulling from all of this information. But the problem is, like I said, when it doesn't fit what he wants, you know, we don't need to go far to find out what happened with Julius Caesar in Britain. You just read his book. He wrote about it. Now, whether it's accurate, we can all speculate and discuss. But the reality of it is, he's written about it. In nowhere in there is this Celtic king who talks to him about freedom and all of this business. There's none of that. In fact, there's no guarantee that these Celtic people understood the Romans and vice versa. So that concept and that idea is the problem. And this is why historians, academics, archaeologists are so skeptical of Geoffrey. And in fact, call him lying Geoffrey, to be blunt, both in his own era and now. He just comes across as so phony. And I mean, it's too bad in a way, because if his information was accurate, it would give us a huge window into a period of time that we don't have any information about, really. And it would give us a lot to go on and a lot of things that would be brilliant to have. But because he's not done that, because it didn't fit his need, we're stuck with what he's got. I mean, it would be wonderful to have him writing up the stuff that he had available to him, because maybe he had access to stuff we don't have. But I come to the conclusion, based on the information, that really, he only had access to what we had. That whatever there may have been written after or during has disappeared. We've lost it. We lost it well before it ever got to the middle, high Middle Ages. And we just don't have it. We have the poetry. We have the annals. We have the, the, the writings of the three monks. And that's it. And that was true even in the 12th century. And so that difficulty, that vacancy, that absence makes life so much harder for all of us because now we don't have an easily defined and easily talked about situation. We've got stories and they're stories that are very much the Iliad and the Odyssey of history. And they can't be taken at face value. They can't necessarily be believed. And as much as you want to believe them, as much as you like to believe them, it almost you have to say that to kind of put this into a, into a perspective, there, there's a group that I've seen, and I'm not going to name names, but I'm, I'm just going to say, there's a, there's a musical group that I went and saw one time. I was actually going to see a different group. They were the front band for them. And I remember saying to my wife at the time, it's, it's like, all their good stuff is stuff they didn't write, and all the bad stuff is the stuff they did write. So anything that was original wasn't good, and anything that wasn't original was the good stuff. Which is unfortunate because it made that group a lot lesser in my mind. And so I didn't really like them. And I kind of look at this with Jeffrey. At the end of the day, his good stuff is not his stuff. And his original stuff is not good stuff. It's, it's wonderful storytelling. It's an incredible fantasy book. But it's not history. It's never going to be history. Unless you have a time machine that can go back and prove that somehow he had a book that nobody else has ever found, not even pieces of, that gives him all this information. And the reality of it is there isn't. 
but his influence is so vast, his popularity because of the Arthur story, because of so much of this filling in of the blanks of what we were missing, has made him incredibly popular over the years, has made him the read of that period in, for in some people's minds, going back to his own day to this day. And people still to this day parse his writings to try and figure out the history of Arthur. And you can't really do it because he's not writing history. And it's unfortunate. I continue to say that. I'll continue to say, I really wish he'd have stuck to what he had, worked from that, and gave us a bit more in periods where we were missing stuff. But he didn't do that. And that's why he is pushed aside so often. And it's often why we have trouble convincing academics that Welsh sources are accurate because of the influence he's had over academia and the suspicion that everybody has about his writings. In fact, it's funny. When I was looking for a copy of the history of the Kings of Britain, I actually had to go into the uh, medieval literature section. I couldn't go into the history section. He wasn't there. He was in the literature check section. So it tells you that even booksellers are skeptical enough to not put him in with the histories. And it's unfortunate that people still think of him as a historian because he really isn't. And maybe he's better considered like Gildas, where you have to understand he's writing a polemic. He's writing a, a you know, in Gildas's case, he's writing a, a, a faithful document using Christian themes to try and make a point in his own day. It's not a history doc. And I think that's the same sort of thing with Jeffrey, except for even more so. Because every time Jeffrey brings up a source and starts quoting them, you immediately go, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> Where'd this come from? Oh, it didn't come from anywhere. Okay, well then, based on the argument and understanding that we have, I'm afraid we just don't have it. So... That's where we're at with him, I'm afraid. It's unfortunate. I really, really, really wish I could be more positive, more excited, more more driven to be a friend of Jeffrey Monmouth, but I'm not. I'm on the opposite side from him. I'm not going to accept what he's written. You can tell from the last few episodes I've not quoted anything from him. I try and actually avoid quoting him at all, and uh, I, I will would have continued to steer clear from him no matter how long we were in that discussion. So now he's out of he's he's now in our rearview mirror as far as this is concerned. And I don't have to worry about him anymore because now his writings don't go any farther than this. So now we can move forward and we can use what we have as historical documents, historical sources. They're few and far between still. We're getting closer. Once we get to about the tenth century and then the eleventh century especially, we suddenly have a grand load of sources that we can pull from, including talking about urban living and all sorts of things that we just don't have now. And and I'd love to get more into those kind of stories, but it's difficult to do until we have enough source material to work from. But we're getting there. We're closing in. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for listening. I hope you're having a great day. We are closing in on our live stream that we talked about in the ad in the first of this show uh, on June the 10th. On a Saturday during the day, we are having a fundraising live stream for some friends of mine in Distractions Media who are going to be going to Gen Con in Indianapolis. Uh, if you'd like to help us out with that, you're more than welcome. We would very much appreciate it. If you just want to come by and watch what we're doing and watch the things we get up to, they're a lot of fun, and I, I think they're well worth they're well worth your time and effort for sure. Uh, otherwise, thank you so much for listening. Uh, if you'd like to leave us a rating and review on iTunes or Stitcher or any other option that you have, please do so. It does help other people find us. And thank you so much for your comments and compliments and, and continued support for our our little podcast here. And as we approach the year mark, I'm, I'm hoping to have some exciting news for you all. So keep, keep watching the airwaves. We're getting there. We're getting there. And we're next week, we'll go back into the history. And it'll be a lot of fun, I guarantee it. Anyway, until next time, everyone, bye. This has been a Distractions Media production. For more information, you can check out everything we do at distractionsmedia.com.